The town of Smithtown was first settled in 1665. 2015 marks the 350th anniversary of the town. Smithtown is one of the original 10 towns that make up Suffolk County. The town has a colorful and fascinating past, and this year we celebrate its history with many events and festivities. We'll explore this history through a series of programs that look into the past as we look towards the future. The hamlet of St. James was historically known as Head of the Harbor until 1853. In that year, Episcopalians living in the area built a church on North Country Road and named it the St. James Episcopal Church. Two years later, when the federal government opened a post office in the area, the name of St. James was chosen for the postal district, a name the community has retained to the present day. On June 9, 1856, the post office opened in Richard Smith's General Store, located on Marich's Road. The General Store was in the heart of St. James, as it existed in the 1860s. The little country village with 30 homes was clustered along Marich's Road, Three Sisters Road, and Harbor Hill Road. Some of the original mailboxes of these homeowners still exist in the back of the store. People came to the store to collect their mail and purchase things they needed, such as yard goods, kitchen wares, medicine, shoes, candy, tobacco, fruits, vegetables, and baked goods. The store was a central meeting place where town folk gathered to wait for the mail, find out the local gossip, and pay their taxes. Other stores existed in the area, but they have all been taken down or converted into private homes. One of these stores stood south of the general store on the southeast corner of Harbor Hill Road and Marich's Road. In 1913, it was the St. James Post Office. Further south along Marich's Road, where the Gulf Gas Station stands today, was where Monahan's Blacksmith and Wheelwright Shop was located. And across North Country Road was where the St. James Hotel was to be found. This building was standing not so long ago and was then known as the Gold Coast II, but was lost in a fire. All that remains of the old hotel is the triangle of land where it once stood. Many of the people who lived in St. James were farmers. Some made their living cutting cordwood and hauling it down to the dock at the end of cordwood path. Others made a living harvesting shellfish, scallops, oysters, and clams, which were taken by sloops to New York City. So lived the people of St. James in the 1860s. The tranquility of the little country village of St. James was shattered with the coming of the railroad. By 1872, the Port Jefferson branch of the Long Island Railroad reached St. James. There was no railroad station in St. James, but in 1873, the people of St. James pooled their resources, raised the $750 needed to construct a station, and Calvin Lamadou built the station. Having a railroad in St. James changed the community in a number of ways. It made it possible for businessmen and professionals to live in St. James and commute to the city. To the north of St. James, on land that surrounded St. James Harbor, many old farmhouses were purchased by wealthy individuals and then converted into magnificent homesteads. One of the first individuals to do this was the architect Stanford White. Shortly after he married Bessie Smith, the youngest of the five daughters of John Lawrence Smith, White purchased the Carmen Farm on Marich's Road. The farmhouse was remodeled on three separate occasions in the 1880s, 1890s, and at the turn of the century, and transformed into a magnificent country estate known as Box Hill. One of Bessie's sisters, 
Ella, also came to live in St. James, in a farmhouse that Stanford White remodeled for her. Ella married Devereaux Emmett, a famous golf course architect, and they acquired the house known as Sherawag on the east side of St. James Harbor. The original house, thought to have been built as early as 1688, can be seen in this photograph. For his sister-in-law, Stanford White added a west wing with a double porch that increased the size of the house and created an elegant country estate. In 1892, Stanford White designed and built a large home for another sister-in-law, Kate Annette Wetherill. This impressive house of field stone and glass is built in the shape of a Maltese cross. These homes are classic examples of Stanford White's work and are representative of the Gold Coast estates that were built around St. James Harbor. Other large estates existed along North Country Road. To the east in the hamlet of Mills Pond, the Mills family owned a large stately home, the Mills Pond House, that today serves as the home of the Smithtown Arts Council. West of this house was the home of the Lawson family, and they created a large home by joining two houses together. And in the midst of St. James was Deepwells, the elegant home of Supreme Court Justice William J. Gaynor of Brooklyn, who purchased this house as a summer home in 1905. Deepwells was largely an unimproved farm, and he developed it into a fine estate. In 1910, Justice Gaynor was nominated and elected mayor of New York City on the Democratic ticket. He had run as a staunch advocate of good government and won on a reform ticket. The fact that the mayor of New York City had a country home in St. James placed the tiny community on the map and drew more people to St. James. The presence of these large estates offered employment opportunities to many residents and brought in new people. The workmen who moved into St. James found quarters on the estates or had new homes constructed south of North Country Road. Many of these homes can still be seen along North Country Road. With the construction of new homes along North Country Road, businesses opened up along this heavily traveled highway. The first gas station in town opened in O'Berry's garage. And the population of St. James was growing as well. By the summer of 1903, over 100 actors were making a pilgrimage to St. James, and the wooded hollow found off Harbor Hill Road and Three Sisters Road, where Willie Collier's house was located. Willie Collier was one of the foremost actors of the day, and his presence in St. James drew other actors and actresses to the little village. They rented houses in the area or stayed in boarding houses such as the Jane House or in hotels nearby like Tony Farrell's Shore Inn on St. James Harbor or the St. James Hotel on North Country Road. This concentration of actors in the area created an actor's colony that frolicked with fun through the summer months. Often these actors and actresses gathered in Liberty Hall the original one-room schoolhouse in St. James that Willie Collier purchased for the actors to use as a clubhouse. It is still standing today opposite the house that was Collier's home and not far from its original location on the top of the hill where this house stands today. This building is the second schoolhouse that was built in St. James. Stamford White designed this schoolhouse in 1895 and it served the community of St. James until the third schoolhouse on North Country Road was built in 1905. In 1938, the present schoolhouse was built on Lake Avenue. As the popularity of St. James as a summer resort grew, the demand for summer rentals and cottages led many landowners to sell their land for residential development. This brought real estate speculators to the beautiful rolling countryside and led to advertising brochures like this one produced by the House and Home Company for 300 
$400 or $500, a man could buy a house on an avenue or street in St. James Park, a whole new area of St. James that was ripe for development. By the turn of the century, the population of St. James had risen to over 400 permanent residents, and many of the newcomers were living south of the railroad tracks in the area that the old-timers of St. James derisively called Boomertown. The first house erected in Boomertown was built in 1898 in the area of Gaynor Park. Others followed rapidly. It is said that lots were marketed to immigrants as they came off the boats at Ellis Island. This might account for the presence of so many Germans, Norwegians, and Swedes in St. James. As newcomers flooded into St. James, churches were organized to meet their needs. In 1872, the Methodists constructed a church off Mariches Road where the St. James Methodist Church stands today. The original church was struck by lightning and burned to the ground in 1897 and was replaced by the present church built in 1898. In 1909, the Saints Philip and James Catholic Church was erected and formally dedicated, and Catholics had a house of worship. And in 1928, the St. James Lutheran Church was built to accommodate the many Lutherans who had made St. James their home. As more people moved into Boomertown, the center of the community shifted and the St. James Business District moved south as well. In 1901, a feed store was built by Joseph Amy on Railroad Avenue. In 1905, a hotel was erected on the corner of Lake Avenue and Railroad Avenue, where Gargiulo's Bakery stands today. Known as the Nessequag Hotel, the hotel attracted visitors from New York City who would come out by train for a vacation in the country. The hotel had the latest conveniences, gas lighting and indoor plumbing. In 1908, the business district continued to expand when Joseph Amy erected the Flatiron Building across from the railroad station. Further south on Lake Avenue, other stores and shops were in existence in the 1920s. In the aerial photograph, you can see that the business district, by the 1920s, stretched far to the south, all the way to the St. James Park Hotel. The photograph also reveals how open the landscape was surrounding Lake Avenue and how sparsely populated St. James remained. Beyond the St. James Park Hotel, private homes fronted Lake Avenue all the way down to Woodlawn Avenue. With all these homes and businesses springing up in St. James, interest grew in organizing a fire department, and in 1908, the Eagle Hook and Ladder Company No. 1 was formed. This firehouse and hook and ladder company would serve the St. James community until 1922, when a new fire department, the St. James Fire Department, was created and money was raised to build a new firehouse at the north end of Lake Avenue. With the construction of all these buildings and stores around the railroad station in St. James, it wasn't long before the St. James Post Office moved from its location near the general store on Mariches Road to a new site on Lake Avenue. On August 18, 1913, it was housed in the building that is today the dressmaker's shop and then it was moved to the south side of the building that used to house Knopf Singer's hardware store. Here it became the hub of the surrounding St. James community. Moving the post office heralded the shift in location of the population of the town and gave a clear signal to the old timers of St. James that the boomers were now in the majority and would soon be controlling the seats of power. Not long after this, the incorporated villages of Nessequag and Head of the Harbor were created. In 1926, the largest state owners along the Nessequag River and the western shore of St. James Harbor 
banded together and formed the village of Nessequag. In 1928, the large property owners who lived north of St. James and on the east side of St. James Harbor followed suit and created the village of Head of the Harbor. These villages were created so residents could govern their own zoning and prevent the extension of commercial areas into their villages, thereby preserving the integrity and charm of the land surrounding St. James Harbor. So the community of St. James was split into three areas and this division remains to this day. Now, 100 years later, the nature and character of the stores and businesses in St. James has vastly changed as the town itself has been transformed from a little country village with hundreds of residents into a suburban town with thousands of people. St. James has seen new residential development south of Woodlawn Avenue. The business district has remained concentrated along Lake Avenue, but it too has spread south as far as Woodlawn Avenue. The St. James that is emerging today is a far different place from the little country village that it once was 100 years ago. Yet it retains the look and feel of a little country village. <laughs>